Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Unpaid Movie Critics. Today, we attempt to answer the question, what is the secret of gummy berry juice? But before that, I would like to introduce my co-host, the dashing and daring, courageous and caring Miss Becky Fixel, member of the Detroit Film Critics Association. God, you can never get it right. <laughs> Whatever it is. It's Whatever Detroit, it is. There's film, it's something. Film Critics Society. Society Association, Shamizle, Shamazel, Tomato, Tomato, Pink and Green. It's all the same. Anyway, Mr. Sametz, who's been out playing and going to movies, what movie did you guys go see in the park? Did you go see Oh, it, it was Hocus Pocus. Okay. But you guys in LA at least do Halloween well. Like your yes. neighborhoods are so decked out. We don't, well, I think there's a couple places around Detroit that do, but not anything at all like you guys do. That Well, I mean, it's Detroit. So, I mean, you know, the fact that you can leave the house on Devil's Night, I mean, is kind of a miracle in and of itself. I don't think there were any fires except at MSU, and that's not anywhere near Detroit. So. It's all the same. No, it? it's not. So this week we are discussing Rocky Horror Picture Show. Woohoo. Woo we're doing the time warp again. Yes. And Mike has set up a special guest for us. So why don't you introduce our guest? Well, when we were talking about Rocky Horror and doing a special, you know, kind of like Rocky Horror episode um, for all three of us listening, I just felt like there's only one person that we, we could have on. And that was the incomparable and stunning Miss Lisa Kurt Sutton. Lisa's been, you know, and I, I remember when we first started talking at one point, um, I had mentioned Rocky Horror and Lisa's like, oh, well, let me tell you some stories. And she just started talking about all these stories of Rocky Horror. And I was like, okay, so um, this is perfect. So we can kind of come on and talk to Lisa, who's been part of the Rocky Horror legacy and lore for such a long time. Um, so Lisa, introduce yourself a little bit. Why don't you give us a little bit of a history about uh, yourself and what you started off with Rocky Horror? and why you love it. <laughs> um, yeah, got, got three hours. Uh, mm -hmm. I started with Rocky Horror before it was a movie. Um, I did not see the play, but I lived in Los Angeles and I can remember seeing the ads in the paper in the LA Times for the Rocky Horror Show. And I was curious, what is this? Um, they had the little uh, Columbia head illustration that uh, aficionados will recognize. Um, and I would just like, this is weird, what is this? And um, I hate to give away my age, <laughs> but I was um, not driving age in 1975. I was actually um, in junior high um, when the movie came out and they opened it in Westwood Village, which is one bus ride away from my house or where I lived then. And um, so back then, Every kid that lived in West LA just went to the movies all the time in Westwood Village. It was the thing. So you're going to see every movie that plays in Westwood, regardless of whatever. So I've been going to Rocky Horror since way back when. Um, I actually, I, I should stop and say, I saw the trailer for the movie before it opened at the UA Westwood which is the first theater that was, they had a, an exclusive premiere there. I went with my dad to see a movie there and they showed them the trailer for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I remember being transfixed on the screen and looking at this thing. And my father leans over to me and says, I am not taking you to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, so I'm on my own. So anyway, um, in Los Angeles, I, I mean, I can get into the whole history of here in LA, it never stopped playing from the day it opened. Um, elsewhere, it bombed and went away. Here, it um, just moved from theater to theater. And uh, early on, um, I can remember, uh, and what got me seriously into it was it played at a theater. Um, I grew up in uh, Pacific Palisades, which is a little beach community here in LA. And um, we had a movie theater called the Bay Theater, and it was walking distance from where I lived. So it came to the Bay Theater in like February of 77. And um, so I went to see it on a Friday night with one friend. And my friend abandoned me in the theater. And I sat there watching it, being really pissed at my friend for abandoning me to go chase after some boy. 
<laughs> and you know, it's like, okay, now I've seen this movie, I've seen it a couple times, big deal. Um, the next night, another friend of mine said, hey, Rocky Horror is playing at the Bay, let's go. And I said, well, I went last night with Heather and that didn't turn out too well. She goes, oh, come on, you've got to see it again. It's like, I'm thinking, oh my God, I have to go see this again. <laughs> and going to see it with a friend who sat there and was like, oh my God, this is great. Having seen it a couple times and knowing what was kind of coming, it changed a lot for me because it was like, wow, I didn't notice this. I didn't notice that. You know, suddenly I was mm -hmm. noticing things about it. I found it. it interesting that you didn't love it the first time through, even, you know, with the friend situation probably tainted it a little. I, but... I liked it a lot. You know, I mean, I liked it. I didn't think about, you know, it wasn't a cult then. You know, it wasn't something that you thought of, like, I'm going to go see this again and again and again. I know there are people that were like that. But for me, it was like, I'm going to the movies. This is what's playing at the theater down the street because we want to see everything. I mean, I saw Jaws 50 times at the same theater because it's like it played forever. Saturday Night Fever played for months. So you went to saw Saturday Night Fever, not because I was really into it. You just went back and saw it. Yeah. But this was kind of interesting because my friend Amy, who I went with, she was like, that's great. The music is so good. And that was a Saturday. So she spent the night at my house. And the next day we went to Westwood Village to um, look for the soundtrack album. And we couldn't find it because it was actually out of print by then. Um, it never it was never really released in America until later. So we just became obsessed with finding this record. But when we were looking for this album, we started finding like, here's this play. And like, oh, look, there's this, this other record. There's one from Australia. There's one. So. Um, we got, she, she bought the record of the play, brought it home, listened to it. And then we um, decided to go see it again. And it was playing at the New Art a couple of weeks later. So convinced my mom to take us and we went. And that time was pivotal because the theater was mostly empty, but there was one row of people in the front row dressed like the Transylvanians in the movie. And they were, they were like screaming and clapping at all the right times. And um, Amy and I, when we saw it, it was just like this really weird thing. We said, let's go see it at the new art. Oh, and we can bring a couple things. And it's like, yeah, I'm gonna bring a teddy bear to hold up during Eddie's teddy. And she said, yeah, let's bring no noisemakers. Like, uh... And so when the time came for the creation scene, and we just like, you know, when they're all, look, yay. So we brought out our noisemakers and the people that were there all laughed and, you know, applauded us. That was the moment because suddenly I became a, like a stand up comic or I got attention. I don't know. And it became like, I want to go again. Then and I'm going to bring my noisemakers. Not just a movie. It became this other thing. And I want to say, I, I, I know I'm going on about this, but what's really important to know. A, it was spontaneous. Nobody told us to do that. And I don't think anybody had ever done it before. Or they could have, how would I know? But it became a thing where every time we went to see it again, it would be like, okay, we would bring more or say things. And um, back then, that third time I saw it, the only um, comment that was made during the movie was meatloaf again. And of course, that was like the funniest thing in the world the first time you hear it. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, for me, it became like, I'm going to think of something I'm going to say. And I'm going to go see it next month when it plays at the Fox Venice. And then, you know, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that. And this is how it grew, you know. So mm -hmm. it grew for me, but it also grew for other people the same exact way. So how many That's times do you think you've seen the movie? I could never count, honestly. Um, there are people who've seen it way more times than me. Um, I mean, hundreds, literally hundreds. Um, I can remember making a really big deal out of my 69th viewing, <laughs> just because. Fair. Um, yeah. And uh, the hundredth viewing, and that was in 1979 or 78. Yeah, by, by, I mean, by 1979, I'd seen it over a hundred times. Okay. That's yeah. a lot. Of, that's a lot of times, Lisa Kurt Sutton. You know, my mother always said I like to do things to excess. She might be right. <laughs> <laughs> so 
then this love for the movie and the experience kind of fueled and turned into something else later. Yeah, well, I, um, you know, to continue on with my long story is, I mean, I literally became part of the crew um, at the Tiffany Theater in Hollywood on the Sunset Strip. And that was pandemonium and mayhem. And it just became, we, they showed it at midnight, 2 a.m. every Friday and Saturday. So that was seeing it four times a weekend. Um, and then in the summers, they would show it on Thursdays at 2 a.m., which was kind of boring because not a lot of people showed up. So I went to a few of those. But, um, you know, but I became really good friends with the people at the theaters. I became really obsessed with back then there was no Internet. So to get knowledge, you had to get, you know, whatever info you could. There weren't even books. So it's like you'd go out and find magazines and old newspaper articles or go to, up to Hollywood book and poster and buy stuff and you would word of mouth. But I became very obsessive about learning about every little aspect of it. And that led to uh, at the 15th anniversary of the movie, I actually had been working. I had previously been working at Rhino Records. And I had left Rhino to go work at a company called Enigma, but Rhino contacted me um, and asked me if I would write a proposal for a box set for the 15th anniversary, nice. which led me to working directly with Lou Adler, who was the producer of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, putting together this 15th anniversary box set. And it led to a 15 year relationship with them and doing stuff for Rocky Horror. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. I have a question. We were actually rewatching. I rewatched the movie uh, <laughs> this week. And I, I was, I, I know, I always noticed in the beginning for the wedding scene during Damn It Janet, you had <clears throat> Tim Curry and Richard O'Brien in that scene. What was the purpose of having them in that <laughs> scene as different characters and then later on as their actual characters in the movie? I was always really trying to put these together and I never really could. Okay. Well, amateur. Um, Sorry. <laughs> you're not a regular Frankie fan. <laughs> everybody in the wedding scene is in the castle. Well, not every, not mm -hmm. literally everybody. I think some of the actors couldn't be, but all the Transylvanians are the, the guests. Right. Um, and uh, every single person that's there. And, you know, it's up for interpretation. My feeling was Brad and Janet were Mark's they sought them, you know, these are these aliens and they sought them out and they were observing them, you know, like, like good aliens do. We're observing your earth, <laughs> you know, right, they right. them, you know, um, this is my cat toast <laughs> <laughs> who loves Rocky horror too. Um, well, who wouldn't, I mean, you she's know. seen it like five times at least, <laughs> you know, which is pretty good for a cat. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I think it was, yeah. So that was kind of what I was I was debating on. I'm like, well, they already have them picked out, but it was kind of an interesting thing because they're so in the background, but they're so prominent. So it's kind of funny when you rewatch it now. I was like, well, there they are. It's like, oh, it's so funny as different people. And Tim Curry has the short hair, mm -hmm. and he doesn't look like Frank and Furter, but he still looks to Tim. Curry. I mean, like, come on, you know. So it's kind of an interesting. I thought it was really interesting the way they did that. I think it's almost like an Easter egg too, you know, when you think about it, that it's just sort of like, I mean, and, and we go back to like what I noticed the second time versus the first time, because the first time I didn't know who Tim Curry was, or, I, you know, I didn't know who Riff Raff was, or I didn't know the actor. So that's the opening scene. So you kind of miss it. But when mm -hmm. you go back, I mean, it ended up being brilliant, I think, because you go back and go, oh my God, that's them. Right. <laughs> also you know, but the bad to like the plays where they have the whole cast and the cast just keeps coming back as different characters too. Yeah. That's how I kind of always seen it because it's, they just have their kind of bubble of people they're using and they just reuse them again. So <laughs> cats, <you> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of, I, I, I love the movie. I think it's really fun. They have such catchy, the beginning especially, it's like up to a certain point. I mean, it's just like the catchy songs. I mean, you have, time warp then sweet transvestite then you have the, the making of rock it's so fun um and it's so it's so 70 it, it's so 70s in in that way it's grungy and gritty and i think that's why this works as opposed to the remake when people try to recapture that and they just can't i didn't even you watch know, the remake 
I you, just, you, you can't change it. You can't fix it. it. It didn't need to be fixed. No. And the only thing about the um, remake that, that I really appreciate, um, I mean, they really tried. They really thought mm -hmm. they were making something that was going to be good. But what I do appreciate is what it did was like the next day, the original soundtrack was back in the top 10 selling CDs on Amazon. Yeah. You know, so it brought people back to it, which is great. And there was a surge in people going to see it again, which is great. I mean, it always it's it's pretty um, it has peaks and valleys, but it's pretty consistent, you know, and then all of a sudden it was like everybody was interested in it again. So great. So why not? That is that is actually some a fun point when you have a remake, people tend to look at the original and try to find the original after that. And I don't think there's anyone that can do Frank and Furter justice no. than Tim Curry. I mean, yeah. that man goes in and he could talk about commanding a room and a performance. Like there, he just owns it. And that's a hard role to own. I mean, you know, you're in fishnets and leather and, you know, oh. it's like the whole thing, you know, he just comes in when he whips that robe off. It's just like, oh shit <laughs> and you have to remember too that in 1975 i mean yeah there were young people in the underground and everything but it was somewhat shocking back then you know mm -hmm. um i mean i was a young teenager you know but i felt kind of like it made me feel really grown up to go see it and it was sort of like it was an interesting kind of awakening um in that uh, as bad as things can be now we're we are really much farther ahead because back then it was like this is gay this is like you know it it didn't you would think it wouldn't play well anywhere out of like say cosmopolitan la or new york or whatever you would think everywhere else it would be like you know you know them spags or whatever you right know? but it opened the world in a way and things have changed so much so now you look at it and people are talking about like oh yeah my babysitter used to show this to me and it's like what right <laughs> i mean i think i seen it when i was in my early teens but i don't think i ever saw this with a babysitter that still seems a little odd yeah you know it, this, i mean if we take the whole you know the gay commentary out of it even just the sexual aspect you don't want to show it to two young kids i would think at least one so. thing that's happened now that I don't like is because we've got this whole, you know, me too, great. You know, there's a lot of things that need to change with people. Um, but there's these weird conversations that people have that are like, you know, oh, Frankenfurter raped Brad and Janet. And it's like, to me, it was consensual watching it. Never considered that that was rape or took them against their, you know, um, and that, you know, Frank is a total hedonist and he had to pay for his, you know, he has to die in the end to pay for his sins. Um, it's like, it's just a movie, you know, it's a parody of horror movies and there's the arc, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I never thought that when I saw it. I mean, I thought, because, you, you know, it, they did have a conversation during those scenes and it was, it was almost like them giving over to their, their impulses, you know, that they actually had. So I never thought that at pleasure. all. Absolute <laughs> right. pleasure. Giving it over to absolute pleasure. But so I, I never felt that, that way. If they were to reshoot it or they were to do something similar today, those scenes wouldn't fly. No. You know, you couldn't film that type of scene without somebody claiming it is rape. So, you know, it's. Yeah, but now it's so funny because now everybody, you know, it's funny. Okay, you have a five-year-old watching The Walking Dead where people's heads get blown off or playing super violent video games, but oh my gosh, exposing them to something that is remotely sexual is like a no-no. It's a strange, it's a strange thing when you're it's like- medical society still, so. Yeah, it's like uber violence, so that's fine. You know, you can watch people, you know, walk down the street and smash them in with a baseball bat. But you know, when you're talking about sexuality, oh, heaven forbid, we actually address situations. It's, it's really weird. I don't understand that at all. I mean, I guess it depends on the age of who you're talking to and how you discuss it with them. You know, you can mm -hmm. discuss sexuality and, you know, 
gender and all of that with kids in terms they understand. But, you know, my nephew being 12, I'd have no problem having him see this movie. I know he's seen worse. He's seen Walking Dead, all of that. But like my friend's kid that's five and three, no, that's, you know, to me, it's too young. They can see it a little later, you know. So no, it, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't yes. that that's young, but it was funny because I was at the Walking Dead a premiere, like you know, in person premiere, and I'm looking over and there was a six year old there, like oh I, he'd seen every episode and da 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 da, and I'm like, yeah, how like that's not it, this is not for kids. It was really kind of I was a little shocked that the parents let that happen, and you know people do it. We were just at a haunted house last week doing something and people had their four and five-year-olds coming out of this thing where there's like ex murderers chasing them. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going through that. I'm not going to send a child through that. So, right. It is strange. It is very strange. I I I don't understand, you know, the, the balance of it. Yeah. Lord, like how is one thing good and one thing bad and, and, and this and that, especially when you look at something, and almost as harmless as the Rocky Horror Picture, especially looking at it from today's standards. Correct. You know, it, it really is. It's very, it's very tame. I mean, and they eat people. So, you know, I mean, you kind of like balance. Speaking of Walking Dead. Um, but <laughs> right. one thing that does bother me that has evolved, like way back when, I mean, I know I'm a little old lady and I'm, I'm an elder uh, statesman <laughs> here, but um, uh, when it comes to Rocky Horror, Way back, you know, we started yelling stuff at Brad and Janet. Okay, Brad was always asshole. (laughs) Right. Janet was, um, you know, they would say, my fiance, Janet Weiss, and we throw up rice and go, Weiss, rice. (laughs) Right. Um, Now they call her slut every time she comes out. And people are always yelling slut at her. And it's like, Okay, I guess over it, it's it's open to interpretation that you know she's a virgin when she starts. Apparently, we we have to assume, <clears throat> and then she becomes she sleeps with Frank with her pantyhose on. So you know, yeah, what was that? Um, <laughs> so you know, oh, I guess I'm hearing the sound of Janet's pantyhose ripping. Um, so then then she gets upset and um, sees Brad in bed with Frank on the monitor. So she is brought to Rocky. So it's sort of like, you know, a fast motion. What would happen in real life? You know, that like, oh, you, you, you did something wrong. You feel bad. You want to go reach out for your love. And then it's like, oh my God, my love did something maybe even worse or just as bad. So you go to somebody else to like, you know, so now Janet's a slut, but she, because she's really bringing like, taking control of her sexuality that's not yeah. slutty that's what women are she's, supposed to be claiming now yeah she's released she's it's okay she's not it's not that she's you know it's just the circumstance and it i mean okay you know it's a it's a movie again so it's like you're going through a story arc here but why is she why do people yell angrily slut at her when frankenfurter is like oh my god he just slept with everyone in the room <laughs> Yeah. Well, that is true. And it's like if Peter Hinwood was running around in his little uh, gold lame shorts, I mean, yeah. listen, yeah. give the give the girl a break. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, I, come on yeah. Now. yeah. So anyway, there's my there's I my mean, Frankenfurter Frankenfurter made her a man. I mean, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> literally, literally blonde hair and a tan. Yes. But and that's the thing. It's really weird because, yeah, Brad is a jerk to her and telling her to be quiet. But it's also. 70s relationships dynamics that we don't well hopefully don't have today we well, don't you know we'd hope that they have an equal say in things but that's it's not- also a it's a 50s or yeah. you know 50s uh Reality. point of view being parodied in the 70s so that's where the sex and stuff all comes in because that's when the whole sexual revolution had had exploded where you know this was written in the early early 70s Richard O'Brien had been in hair um you know dancing around naked on stage with the uh, you know so they the whole cast had been through the hippie revolution and the switch from 
hippie to glitter, you know, the, the right. whole glitter rock thing. So it's sort of like a, and so he's making fun of something that, you know, it's like, let's skewer this by bringing a lot of sex into it instead of innuendo, let's just put it out there, um, you know. Yeah, and it's interesting too, when you look at, you know, every time I see it, I'm like, how did this actually fly as a play? Like, how did they go, you know what? this is something we need to do. Yeah, I, I mean, it's really kind of fun to think that that was the time when you really could do pretty much anything and and get it out there for people to see. Like today, it's always, I think, a little bit more difficult and easier because everyone has a camera, but to find, a, to have things find their audience, you know, like a, like works of, of, of fiction, like plays and things. It's like people can get out there, like if they're singers and songwriters, but actual plays and, and, and things like that, it seems to be a little bit more difficult for them to break through. But, you know, as far as I knew, and, and Lisa, you could probably tell me more, Richard wrote like a, a three fourths of it and they kind of put it on and then it was like 45 minutes and then they said, oh, let's expand it and throw it in. And I think Time Warp wasn't even in the original yeah. production is that right columbia wasn't even in the original script and some of the songs richard had written earlier they were just uh things he had written and then he came up with the idea to to do this um they came from denton high um mm -hmm. and it's really interesting um i can't for the life of me remember the name of the movie but not too long ago somebody forwarded to me a link for this old 50s horror movie that was incredibly obscure. Nobody's seen it, you know, it, unless you sought it out. Right. But it it's like so Rocky Horror. It's like there's so many little elements in it. Now, I don't know how he ever saw it in, in New Zealand, but there's no coincidence that it was like, I'm, sh I, I, I'm speculating that there was like an aha moment because he was really into old horror movies and he would go to movies all the time. And he mm -hmm. must have seen this thing and it must have been one of those weird retro things in his mind that just kind of stuck out there. And it's like, because like the, um, you know, do not enter sign is in the movie the it's like the whole thing it's this couple breaks down in their car didn't we pass a you know let's go find a, a place you know and it's like oh look there's this castle over here um and then there's this mad german scientist um you know uh, you know there's like so many similarities to it that it's like yeah, I get it. Or maybe every movie was like that. I haven't seen every old horror movie. So maybe it was like, so like a common, common, common thing. trope. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was originally just staged as a, um, you know, uh, Richard O'Brien, Tim Curry, a lot of them, you know, a lot of the Transylvanians, they all, it's all interconnected. There's no accident of who was in that movie. Um, they all were part of this theater scene that was at mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the Royal Court Theater had a little experimental place up called the theater upstairs and it had like three rows of seats and uh, yeah let's they put on plays and they were like you know much smaller productions so they created the whole the original play was set up like it was supposed to be a dilapidated movie theater mm -hmm. um, you know so they just kind of went with this theme you know which um they tried to kind of bring back to the the remake as we talked about, but it uh, yeah. didn't work quite the same way. Yeah. And in the original play, I knew I knew a lot of the people like Tim Curry and them were in the original productions and things. But Susan Sarandon and Barry Boswick were the only new people that came into the production when they actually shot the movie, right? Yeah, they definitely they they looked for Americans to play that couple for whatever you know they definitely wanted that so yeah they were the only yeah. two new ones um a couple of the transylvanians were cast by a company called the ugly company that specialized in um kind of weird looking people or unusual so that's how they got um the super tall guy and the super short lady but oh. um but most of the other people um like the dude with the dreadlocks was in a lot of plays at the at the uh, Royal Court Theater. Like, I mean, you start going down the list of the people when you look up their names and and um, it's amazing how many of them like they all knew each other from before. And a lot of them had been in Rocky Horror or, you know, I mean, the play and, uh, right. you know, or other plays with Richard or Tim or, or you know, 
you know? I think that's really fun. I think that it, it kind of lends itself to the familiarity of it. But Meatloaf, he was new, right? Again, for the, for the movie. He came actually the play in Los Angeles. He was cast at um, in the Roxy production. Oh, so they, okay. Yeah, so they kept him. But he wasn't. I mean, and, and I don't know at the time he wasn't Meatloaf at the time. He was still a, kind of an unknown singer, right? This is kind of yeah, a, one had, of his first things. He had records out, um, but nothing was clicking. And so then popular and a name as he is now. No. And, you know, what happened was, so he's in this, in Rocky Horror, the Rocky Horror show, while he's um, not long after the movie came out, um, Bad Out of Hell, he's working with Jim Steinman on that album. And one thing that worked in his favor that might be forgotten now, but they made an agreement to, um, they got them to show his videos before Rocky Horror. Oh, nice. So what happened was... This album came out at the exact same time. I mean, you know, give or take around the time Rocky Horror was exploding in popularity and people were going to see it over and over again. And then this album comes out. So the album was very Springsteen-y, you know, Mm -hmm. so it it has that same kind of vibe to me. So it's like, if you like this music, you're going to like that music. So it probably would have been a hit anyway, but Rocky Horror helped catapult it just awesome. made it insane because every single rocky horror person went out and bought i mean when the rocky horror soundtrack came out it, it was on the charts for years you know mm-hmm. it's and it's it comes back every now and then and it's it's um you know it's always been a really big seller a consistent but especially seller. i mean especially at halloween i mean i don't think you can ever you can escape a time warp during halloween i mean let's be real <laughs> I mean, and how many covers have there been? And that song is just such a great song. And especially the little dance, like, you know, put your hands on your hips. I mean, it, it's an <laughs> instructional video at the same time. And it, it, it's just such a, a fun, fun song. It's, and that wasn't in the original play. Is that right? They added it later. Yeah, they added it later. And the whole thing with Columbia was, was written. They wrote the part for uh, Little Nell. <clears throat> because they saw her she was tap dancing outside the theater and they thought she was great so it's like oh let's find a way to get you in the play <laughs> so she wasn't really the original thing people right off the street literally <laughs> yeah literally um and yeah wrote a part for her and then created this tap dance and it literally in the middle of uh or not i guess that's in the movie but the um yeah it's in the it's in the play too and um yeah, it was just one of those things where we need to make this longer. We need to make this longer. Let's come up with something. <laughs> and that's funny. And, and that's did. the best. I mean, arguably the best song in the entire thing yeah. is the Time Warp because yeah. it's so, I mean. I'd rather see so that catchy. at weddings than I would, you know, like the Hokey Pokey and those ones. You the know, if somebody dance. has Time Warp at a wedding, that's the wedding I want to be at, not the other ones. Right? So, that's just me. I'm telling you. It's like when you have your wedding, Becky, and we're doing that, we're going to do the time warp again. Oh, I already, I've said that for years. That was going to happen. So, yeah, we actually had a Rocky Horror wedding in 1978. Uh, in fall of 1978, a couple that um, were, were regulars at the theater got married and the Frankenfurter at the theater at the time was the, he officiated. That's awesome. And so, yeah, he married. That's them. hilarious. Yeah, it was and in costume. So there are pictures. Uh, no, as as Eddie in Columbia. Oh, okay. And um, but it was covered by there's an old uh, issue of Circus Magazine where they covered it, so oh, you can really see. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. So, hey, Lisa, I was I have a question for you. Since you were around in the beginning, when did the shadow casting start? When they actually had people reenacting the parts with the movie. Because that was, was kind of a whole different scene as opposed to the talkbacks. That's a whole, whole different aspect. Whole different thing and very different in the beginning um, for us and the New York people. Because I've talked to people that were like, you know, I've talked to Dory Hartley, who was the first Frankenfurter there, you know, about what went on there. Um, so, like I said, when I went to the New Art, there these people dressed up like Transylvanians the first time I saw it. So, as time went on, um, what happened here in LA I can speak to that um there was this guy Michael Wolfson 
who went and saw the movie the very first week it was out in, at the UA Westwood. And the very first time he saw it, he, it spoke to him. He was a big horror fan. And he was like, I want to make a Frankenfurter outfit. So he did. And he came mm -hmm. up with this idea that he would, um, he was thinking this would be some, you know, got to do something with this. I wonder if there's a way. So he actually thought of it himself. I'm not saying that he started the whole thing, but he did it. And then, so the movie came out. So maybe it was a year later, there was a costume contest at the Fox Venice. And there was a guy there dressed as Riff Raff and Michael's dressed as Frankenfurter. So this is 1976, I wanna say, it was 76. And he says, I'm Frank, you're Rip, let's put on a show. And they talked the Fox Venice, the same theater that had the, the costume contest into letting them put on something they called the Rocky Horror Review. Hmm. So they started doing this in late 76 into early 77. And it was a, um, because the movie didn't play there every week, it wasn't a weekly thing yet. Um, it was a like, but it was a special add on. So they would perform before the movie. And they always oh, okay. showed, um, it was always Rocky Horror at seven, um, the Rocky Horror Review. And then they would have like another movie, usually Phantom of the Paradise or something like that. And they would come back and show Rocky Horror again. And we would sit through like all three movies and we would see the Rocky Horror Review a couple times. And um, meanwhile in New York, now um, New York started was the first place to show it exclusively as a midnight movie. Like it had played here at midnight before and was gaining traction as a midnight thing, but they marketed it in New York starting, um, the first week in April of 76. So they, um, from what I understand, coincidentally, not coincidentally, the first time people showed up in costume in New York at the Waverly, which is the theater that's given credit for starting the cult, well, they dressed up the first time in at Halloween. So they prepared for their Halloween. And, but as I just mentioned, it happened here in Halloween, but this guy had made his costume, you know, months and months and months before and had this idea months and months before you know hmm. so meanwhile also i had brought props they talk about them first bringing props later you know so things were going on and i'm not trying to make it sound like oh it was better here there's no competition it's great but i think it was like this weird spontaneous comp uh combustion at the same time and it was, there was something about it that like, I made a costume really early on. I started, I went out and bought a pair of tux tails and I made a little Transylvanian outfit. After this, you know, third, fourth time I saw it, I started wearing the tux tails every time I went to see it. And mm -hmm. then when the Rocky Horror Review came around and they needed people, it's like, I'm just gonna jump on stage and time warp with them. So that was, I mean, I got a little personal about how it was for me, but with everybody else, I just think it was spontaneous combustion that people started dressing up. But back then, there were always like with the Tiffany in particular, we did a, we did a floor show before we called it the floor show. Mm -hmm. We did it before we did it after during the movie, we did things where we, the Tiffany was great because the screen was really low profile. So you can make shadow puppets on the screen or hold <laughs> things up. And one of the greatest things we ever did that got the best. I mean, you've never heard laughs like this before is we took marquee letters, J A N E T. And we would go to the middle of the theater so when Brad sings J A N E T, we would we right. had a group of us and we'd all J A N E T, and people would just I mean the, <laughs> you thought the roof was going to come down. People thought that was just the greatest thing ever. Um, but yeah, so there were things we did during the movie, but didn't necessarily get up in front of the screen for the whole thing. But within the next couple of years, like I remember I stopped going when I, I graduated high school and I went off to college and I stopped going to see it as a regular thing. And then I think the next time I went to the Tiffany, like a couple of years later, just before it closed, you know, they had a jukebox over here and they had all, you know, it was like, it just evolved and it evolved quickly. Mm. And I'm gonna add one more thing. I think one of the things that added to it, so the people in New York had their little thing where they created this whole um, Sal Piero, the pr president of the fan club. I mean, bless him that he really got this whole thing uh, organized worldwide. You know, people had a 
newsletter to read and news coming from all over the place and he would travel around. But um, what happened was they had their particular pre-show and then this little movie called Fame came out. <laughs> <laughs> little movie, little movie. So, yeah, so Fame comes out and it creates a whole new generation of Rocky Horror fans because it's early, it's, it was 1980. So Rocky Horror had already been around for five years but they made it such an integral part of that movie but they filmed it at the 8th Street Playhouse. They had their little, you know, like pre-show thing. The girl runs up to go on stage. People started copying that because they saw that. So now oh. the standard at all these theaters is to have the pre-show with the virgin sacrifice and, you know, introducing like a Barker before. I, I can only speak to where I've been in shows I've seen and I saw a lot you know, hundreds of times at dozens of theaters between 75 and, you know, 80 something. And I never saw anything like that until the 90s, you know, being everywhere, you know. Right. So I, I attribute fame to bringing a, another explosive burst. So I always call people like that, like 75 to 80 is first generation, then the famers, you know, those are the to, to me they're newbies but you know those are the that's like the next generation middlers you know and then uh yeah so but it's still a movie the that, i mean younger generations absolutely they watch it they still get attached to it so yeah it's kind but of they're timeless it's weird there's there's this weird thing that goes on too that there are people that are not so into the movie but they just love the whole they want to be part of the cast which i find very interesting because i've heard people i've seen people online comment about that like uh, you know they just want to be but um there's something to be said about the whole as it grew back then you know again it's from my point of view but when I first started going, okay, it was me and this one friend who ditched me. Then it was me and this other friend who was into it. Then now I'm in high school and I've got a whole new group of friends that are into it and we go all the time. And then, you know, we start going to Hollywood, to the Tiffany and my friend group was huge. You know, my whole social life revolved around Rocky Horror, all these people I met at Rocky Horror. So I'm hanging out with people from Hollywood or other schools or whatever. And then we've got this home base of this theater and part of the driving force is, okay, what are we gonna do this weekend? What are we gonna dress like? What are we gonna do, you know? you know. So it became a social driver. So I loved mm -hmm. the heck out of the movie, but I also loved these people and these people became my best friends. And, you know, it was just, it's just like being a cheerleader in high school or being uh, you know, on the basketball team or whatever. It's something that's going to follow through. So it also became, I know for a lot of people, the fact that so many of the guys were gay at, at, in the crowds that I hung around with, I mean, and girls, some of the girls were, and um, it was a very open and loving environment and very welcoming Mm -hmm. And every week he made a new friend. I can't imagine that being much different now. You know, if you stick with it and go week after week, you're going to make friends. You're going to just hang out. You're going to get a crowd, you know, it's, it's kind of like cool. created in its own little safe space. Yeah. Bubble. That's interesting. I love that though, because you, know, you think about communities and I think everything can have a community and you look at a movie for a movie to create that, that's such a, it's such a rare thing. Everything that happened with Rocky Horror was a rare thing you know, and this, that in and of itself, if you can create a safe space, and especially at a time period where a safe space doesn't exist, I mean, that was probably before West Hollywood was really prominent. That was before a lot of these things were really there that, you know, I, I mean, just knowing the history a little bit of Stonewall and all of the, uh, you know, how, you know, gay bars were always targeted by police and things like that, you know, seeing a movie be able to create a space like that is such an amazing, amazing thing. Yeah. And it was also, you know, it's kind of funny, like, again, it's different everywhere, I'm sure. But like in LA, like, more than one person has told me the same thing that like, one friend of mine said, he, you know, he started going to the Tiffany because he was driving down the street at two in the morning, bored, you know, he's like 16 year old in his first car. 
where am I going to go? No friends. No, it's like, hey, look, there's a movie and it's playing at 2 a.m. So he pulls into the parking lot, goes to the movie, goes in. And the first person he meets is this guy we called him Queen George. Mm -hmm. I, I was called Queen George. He was he was such a great guy. Um, he um, but he was like the unofficial ambassador. So it's like, you know, he's there at the 2 a.m. show. Probably almost nobody else was there because people would leave back in the earlier days. He didn't necessarily stay for the 2 a.m. show. So, you know, he meets them. They become friends. Um, the guy says, oh, I'm going to come back again, you know, next week. And then there's George. But George introduces him to this person and that person. And, you know, that guy ended up working at the theater after a while, you know. <laughs> I kind of like the concept of somebody driving around at 2 a.m. and going in to see Rocky Horror without knowing what it's about. Like, I like going into movies without watching previews when I go to screen them. But this one would be one that just would take you for a ride if you have no idea what you're going in to see. Yeah. So, And I'm, especially in the 70s. Right. Because like, today, now it's Smith, you yeah, know, it was very, it, you know, as as. Um, Weak and opening as it had, it was very unique for the time. It was almost too unique, which is why I think it uh, crashed and burned elsewhere and only became popular as it grew. But they were really smart with the marketing too. I mean, you want to talk about brilliant, brilliant marketing. They knew they had, you know, Fox wanted to pull it. And um, Tim Deegan and Lou Adler, Tim Deegan was a marketing guy and Lou Adler was, um, you know, the producer of the movie. They wouldn't give up on it. And Tim Deegan came up with the whole idea of like, let's just put it in places one by one. Let's see how it goes in New York. They had actually, before it went to New York, they were test marketing it all over the place at midnight. So it played mm. in Milwaukee and they would give away a free t-shirt if you went. And right. boy, talk about if I had one of those t-shirts, I can remember trying to talk one of them off of somebody once at the, I ran into someone at the Fox Venice that had one of the original shirts. There was no merch back then. There was zero merch until 19... 79 so from 75 to 79 you just could you were you, all you could get was movie posters or whatever that t-shirt was so coveted i have only seen one that was genuine turn up on ebay and it was 500 bucks um you know but people ask a fortune for this stuff but that shirt i can say it's it's um it's a little different than all the ones that have come out since then. Um, it's hard to explain, but it has a little copyright on the front and none of the other lips have the C, the little circle C. It says copyright 20th Century Fox. That's how you can tell a genuine one, but you'll never find one because nobody went to the movie. They probably burned them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they probably right, used right. them to wash down the candy counter with. <laughs> oh, that's so sad to think about. And I, you know, me being the promo guy, I'm like, no. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a whole um, bunch of, um, they used to give us, back in the early 70s when you went to see the movie, they had, um, it played at very few theaters. Like the Tiffany was literally the 13th theater to have it as an exclusive midnight movie. <laughs> um, but they would pass out, like there was this theater called The Strand and they passed out these bumper stickers like, I saw Rocky Horror, I saw it at The Strand, you know, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, I saw it at The Sombrero, which was in mm. Arizona. So it's like each of the theaters, each of these really early theaters, there's, there's not a whole lot of them around. Like at the Tiffany, they gave us blank ones. I think they just didn't bother to make them. But, um, you know, I've got, I've got them hanging on the wall over here and you can't see them, but you know, like the, it's happening at the Cove, Hermosa, happening at the Sombrero. I saw it at the Wilshire Theater. I saw it at the Strand. Um, so yeah. not that you want to spend this, but on eBay, there is one from the Cove Hermosa for $900. T-shirt? Yes. Yeah, no, thank you. I have the, I have the bumper <laughs> sticker. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> not that you want to spend it, but I, I looked it up and that's the only one in it. I just looked at it, says happening at the Cove Hermosa. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. But yeah, $900 for a T-shirt. I can't even imagine. Yeah. No. You know, if I was rich, I would buy right. it. Right. Um, I can start a crowdfunding, maybe if the, you know, <laughs> the three people that are watching here each want to send me three hundred dollars. I will. I will buy it if uh, if somebody you know helps me earn that money. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, it really is. I love. I love hearing about fandoms though, because that's just the fun thing about what movies and TV shows do is they create. They can create a really good group of people who you know 
gravitate towards a you know something i mean you've seen it with a lot of shows i mean even even more modern shows like buffy and supernatural and but star trek like obviously but series like even lord of the Rings, right. star trek that's a series this is just a one-off and you don't yeah. see that as often you what they try well it wasn't technically a one-off because there was a sequel called shock treatment which is more of an unofficial <laughs> sequel don't you hang I, listen it's a sequel <laughs> nonetheless yeah, I can, you know, it came out 40 years ago today. Wow. Oh, did it really? years ago today. I can't do the math. 1981. Shock. I saw, wow. it the, I saw it the weekend it opened. I went to a, um, you know, everything about Rocky Horror is great. So I'm not going to say negative stuff about it. People love it. But I remember it being such a, going to see a, a pre-screening um, of it at the Fox lot, like a group of 10 or mm -hmm. 20 of us were invited to go see it. And I have my, I still the t-shirt they gave us for that. That's got to be worth 900 bucks. Um, <laughs> Let me uh, I used to have two of them, damn it. <laughs> Don't know where the other one, you know, I think my ex-husband took it when he left. Um, but um, I just remember being just like, the. I think the thing that made it such a big failure to begin with to begin with, it grew in popularity, but um, the premise is great. The songs are great. It's not Rocky Horror. It's, right. They called it a sequel, an equal, not a sequel. I don't think it's an equal, but um, you know, the whole inside the movie, uh, TV set kind of thing was before its time, very Truman before show. Before its time. But it was, um, it was a letdown, but worse than that, they decided to open it at midnight Halloween weekend. And where is everybody on Halloween weekend at midnight? Sleeping off candy comas. No, they're at Rocky <laughs> Horror. Yeah, well, there is that. They're, yeah, they're not going to be. So I went to the premiere of Shock Treatment at the Vista in LA, and there were like 20 people in the audience. And oh, all I no. kept thinking was I should be at the Tiffany. At a premiere. <laughs> That's bad. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a premiere, premiere. I, I used no. it. It was just, but it was opening night yeah and they passed out flyers at the tiffany you know they passed out flyers all over la they passed out flyers everywhere i still have the flyer here if i was smart i would have like had my little show and tell ready but um <laughs> they, you know so it was like yeah let's go to that and you know maybe a handful of us like five from my friend group went but everybody else mm. wanted to be at the tiffany they all i mean at rocky horror i should say yeah. you know so that was that. So that wasn't the greatest idea, but you know, people, they started shadow casting that also. And at the Tiffany, they started showing it after a while as Rocky Horse started waning a little bit, they would show shock treatment at 2 a.m. So mm -hmm. they would do the Rocky Horror Floor Show, then they would change up their outfits and then do the shock treatment thing. And there are people that are mm -hmm. as into or more into shock treatment, so more power to them. That's great. It's colorful. It's pretty. It's got the same kind of palette as Rocky Horror. It just feels a little more contrived. It feels a little more like planned, like they made some inside jokes that were made for comments, you know, right. like Jim Sharman was the name of the producer uh, or the, um, I guess, the executive, I don't know, Blue's the executive producer, Jim Sharman. Um, but then they put like, they go to the, there's a point where the mother uh, Janet's mother Brad's mother I don't even remember puts a thing of toilet paper on the on the counter and it's you know and everyone's like don't squeeze the Charmin <laughs> you know yeah so they, uh, and, they were kind of baiting the audience yeah feeding and that feeding. never and that never works honestly because you can't you can't go out to make a cult classic you make a movie that becomes a cult classic if you yeah. try to make a cult classic the audience audience feels like they're being force fed something it doesn't work yeah. um i like shock treatment though i didn't i wish they would have had barry boss against susan sarandon back i don't know yeah. what, what happened there like if they didn't want to do you know do you know if they didn't want to do it or if they weren't asked because tim um, was supposed to be in it too right i i feel like barry boswick says he wasn't even asked but i think it was because tim curry said no the original script was something entirely different janet got pregnant and was gonna have she had oh. twins oh okay was, I think it was Frank's baby and Rocky's baby or something. Oh, or maybe Brad's. And I don't remember. <laughs> it was so long ago that I saw that. It was like, um, that would have been kind of fun. But Tim Curry refused to be in the sequel. 
Um, so I think that they might have approached Susan Sarandon, but then gave up. And um, Jessica Harper was a great choice. And I love her. She's from Phantom of the Paradise, which is my mm -hmm. other go to love, love, love. I could do a whole two hours, three hours, four hours on that movie, too, because that was that was a year before Rocky Horror. And it was just as big an impact in my life. But um, uh, so Jessica Harper, but um, uh, oh, God, what's his name? I'm thinking Barry Humphreys, uh, Dame Edna, Bert Schnick, the guy who played Brad, whose name is escaping me at this moment, um, was actually originally auditioned to play Brad and wasn't oh. available. So oh, that's and, funny. Yeah, and the other thing is a lot of the people in the audience and these extra people were Transylvanians. You just don't recognize them or see them because right. you know, costume, whatever. So, you know, there was some, there was a lot of like really clever um, crossover stuff going on there. I thought it was very much ahead of its time. I mean, really the the advent of reality TV and all of the the crap we see right now that I can't stand personally, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's in it and it's kind of a fun movie it does not hold a candle to rocky horror yeah. but I, I i you know if you take it on its own it's not a bad movie yeah well the thing about rocky horror too that you have to remember is one of the reasons it bombed also was it had really bad pacing so there are like mm -hmm. all these like silent moments and kind of boring moments and again it's like spontaneous combustion they didn't do it on purpose. It just lent itself to like, I'm gonna yell now because it's like, there's a, you know, there, there are all these pauses and they weren't put there on purpose. They were put there for dramatic, whatever, you know, you know, I think perhaps you'd better both come inside. Right. And then a pot, you know, I think you'd better both, what? Come inside. Where else would you come? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Every step of that movie has a little space that made made it just perfect, perfect for that. But then, like shock yeah. treatment has a in some ways a better story. I mean, like I said, Truman Show to me it was just like mm -hmm. you know getting. Um, there have been several movies like that. Like um, what was it called? Pleasantville. It's very Pleasantville. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, there was a John Ritter movie called Stay Tuned in the eighties that With was very. Dauber. Yeah. There you go. And uh, same kind of idea, you get sucked into a TV, whatever. Um, hey, shock treatment came out long before any of those. And, right. Uh, it was a it was a great idea. It just, yeah. It just didn't land yeah. as well. Yeah. But also opening it at midnight in, it, it, you know, against Rocky Horror was not a brilliant idea. It was brilliant for Rocky Horror because it brought out the creatures of the night but now people are already doing it but i also wanted to mention that that you know the rocky horror people when you talk about these shadow casting and you were saying they don't really do it to other movies it became a thing you know so it's like now they do like on friday we show clue and the rocky horror cast will do clue and then on, oh. or we'll do hedwig or we'll do you know um it's becoming there's a, there's a whole yeah. litany of movies that they'll do this to now um, or like that movie, The Room became very much oh, like right. Rocky Horror, you know, so it's had a huge influence on these other films and fandoms like that, um, you know, but you can't touch it. You can't touch how great no. Rocky Horror is, you know, and, you know, it's one of those things like, um, you know, you wish you could see it again for the first time yeah. because, you know, there's something there's just something magical about getting sucked into it. And the first time you start hearing people make comments and, um, you know, participating and it's like, I liked it a lot better when it was like, kind of, there's a bunch of people, like it used to be everyone dressed up, you know, whether you're dressing up in Rocky Horror costume, you're dressing like a punk, you're dressing like a disco person. Cause you know, disco was huge then too. People would go to the Odyssey disco and then go to the Tiffany after, or go to the Tiffany and then go to the Odyssey after, you know? So mm. there was all this like stuff going on. And um, now it's like, when I go to the movie, you can't hear the movie. You know, you can't even hear the comments because everybody's yelling, you know, sometimes. And sometimes it's better than others, but I don't need the people running around the theater necessarily. I mean, it does add a lot to me now because it's different, you know, but I don't like the sameness of it. like. Back in the day, uh, it was so like you never knew what was going to happen. 
you know, it was different every single time. It wasn't going to see the same movie over and over again. The experience was completely different. So I find it a little scripted now and they pass out scripts sometimes and they give out the mm -hmm. prop bags. So there's nothing to figure out on your own. Now, hopefully they are. Obviously it's evolved a lot and the comments and callbacks are different, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, it was just fun to kind of be creative as opposed to being part of a cast that's like creating something exact. You know, I, I don't think that's as fun as like, you know, I'm going to jump up in front of the screen and time warp and nobody's ever done this before, <laughs> you know, or, you know, no, you have to do it and you have to do it our way, you know, and we only yeah. let cast members do it. It used to be like um, anybody could get up and just do anything, you know. Well, what's and your... that's nice because that's like a spontaneous thing. If yeah. you're getting a list, it's, it's always a little bit different. Sorry, Becky, I had to cut you off. No, that's okay. I just, I'm thinking like going to modern shows now, if we take Rocky Horror Picture out of it, I mean, there's not a ton of other movies that have that type of interaction. You're supposed to be quiet and just watch it. You're not supposed to engage. And it's just this weird kind of evolution for that movie that, but we don't see it in other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you mentioned Clue because it does actually lend itself a little bit to that. I've never seen one of the shadow cast to Clue, but now I want to go because Clue was one of my favorite movies. That was one of those yeah. I grew up with. And that would be, you could see it, you know, when they would be like, and this happened. And, and he's like running and, you know, you could see them doing, you could see what, what, what they could do with that. Um, and, you know, obviously Tim Curry, the, the balance and the, and the, and, and the being there in both of those films yeah. are, are kind of there for both. I mean, yeah, it's kind of neat that they do that. And, and they, you, you know, finding those specific, movies and what people find you know, you know it, it really is neat there's something that that too from the evolution getaway cat the evolution of the whole um yelling back um it was sort of like this whole um uh, uh like the peanut gallery on on um uh buffalo bob and and howdy doody you know like what time is it kids it's howdy doody time it's kind of churchy you know where people like to yell out people like to you know go into a football game and rah 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 all in unison and um but at the same time i can remember being a really obnoxious kid and you know like at the at the bay theater that i mentioned before when i was a real you know six and seven years old and my mom would drop me off to movies and you'd go see a really boring movie, you'd start throwing candy around and kids were screaming right. at each other. And, you know, you'd, it was like, it was pandemonium. And I can remember very clearly with one of my really good Rocky Horror friends long before we ever saw Rocky, or I shouldn't say long before, but before we went to go see Rocky Horror constantly together, we went to see The Exorcist 2 in Westwood Village. And I can remember just like, and this is before we were yelling stuff at Rocky Horror, if I'm, or kind of, you know, around the same time, maybe, but not, you know, we're like making puzzles, <laughs> we're making jokes because <laughs> the movie was so darn bad. You know, this is like this. And I remember some guy getting up and saying, you know, I paid good money to see this movie now, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and people used to do that at Rocky Horror too, in the very beginning, you know, it would be like, you know, meatloaf again, shut up. You know, so it, again, it's all evolution is, it's all perception and, and what you think is fun. It just, you know. And where fun. it's accepted, you yes. know, it's like, yeah. you know what you're gonna get if you're going to a midnight screening, you're getting yeah. a rowdy audience, you're getting them to talk back. If you're going to eight o'clock show, I guess chances are it's gonna yeah. be a little bit less of a- and The other thing about that though, is even recently I went to a thing at this at the silent movie theater you know, where it's like, this is a silent screening. Please do not yell anything during the movie. No participation. And it's like, I can't sit through this. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not fun. I mean, especially for this. It's like, look, if you're, if you're going to go see Rocky Horror, you want there to be everything. You want the experience of seeing it in a theater. I can watch it at home on Netflix or I think it's not on Hulu, actually. Yeah. It's like, and you can see it at home and you'd be like, yeah, that was fun. But. And that's another huge point that made it a real big thing. We did not have videotape machines back then. We did not have copies of this. Nobody had VHS, VHS which is ancient now. <laughs> we couldn't get the album. 
if you liked it and you wanted to if you wanted to relive the music from the movie yeah you could buy the play yeah. album or the london cast but there was no movie soundtrack so you couldn't hear the song um you couldn't see the movie you couldn't turn on you know you had to go see it again if you wanted to see rocky horror you had to go to a theater and when did it play midnight <laughs> that was it 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 i mean all of it was just sort of again like you were saying it's like a spontaneous it was a thing that happened everywhere it was just a weird evolution of every right every duck was in a row every right thing happened for this very wrong movie you know to make it what it is a movie that has mm -hmm. never closed think how remarkable that is even during the pandemic when most people couldn't go see it there was a guy in i believe it was the theater in oregon that refused to let the record be broken to be nixed so he showed it every weekend and he would invite a couple people into the theater the projectionist cool. at the theater so it has oh, literally cool. showed every weekend <clears throat> since it opened in 1975. And it's also wow. one of those things, it can't be replicated now because we have movies hitting theaters and streaming at the exact same time. Yeah. If you want to watch it, you can stream it over and over and over, you know? So yeah. it's not, there's yeah. no way you could replicate that whole type of, you know, the perfect storm to make that happen. Yeah. It was a total A plus B equals C thing yeah. that, um, you know, you couldn't do that now because I think if there were, if it were not playing in theaters, it would not have evolved to the point of the callbacks or whatever. I mean, obviously not, um, but watching at home, you know, there are people who love it for what it is, but to me, it's like, yeah, there's like some things that are just amazing about it, but it was the combo. It was the group participation or the you know hey there are these other people that are into this and it's like it's pretty it's sparkly it's shiny it's it's um it's funny like i'm a teenager and it's ooh, it's dirty <laughs> you know but you know all these things that added up but yeah you, you're only going to watch a movie like that as often as you watch any other movie in you yeah. know i mean you watch charlie brown christmas every uh, every year at christmas time you watch uh um I don't know, uh, Charlie Brown's Great Pumpkin <laughs> every year, Halloween. I'm sure there's yes. other things that are just not coming to my mind right now, but yeah, it would yeah. be like one of those things that you go like, I like this movie, I'll watch it again, but not like, we have to go see Rocky Horror. Like, wouldn't it be fun to go see Rocky Horror? I've heard about Rocky Horror, and what, blah, 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 you know? Yeah, it's a whole experience, not just a movie though. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much, Lisa, for <laughs> joining us. I, I mean, this is so much fun, honestly, because, you know, to, ha to know someone that was there in the beginning of it to really share some of those fun stories, I, I think it's cool, especially because you can't replicate it now. You, you're, no. Like you said, it's with the age of streaming and everything being available now and binge watching. And it was just, it's a different time for people. They don't understand, you wouldn't understand. It's like, you know, it's it's a it's unfortunate in some level like i like binging stuff now but um it does tend to at least for me i should say it does make things a little bit more disposable in terms of content when you don't watch things week to week it's not in your home week to week and so you're watching you know you can binge a show for 10 episodes over the course of a weekend and you're done and yeah. then oh look it came back and you're like oh wait yeah what happened there and i'm not as into it because it was only a little weekend blip whereas you know if you're watching something for 22 weeks through the course of five months every year for seven years that's part of your routine yeah. you know Antissa, it's the antissa patient <laughs> you know it's you need that antissa until next week patient yeah you know, like watching Alias, it was like, how the hell is Jennifer Garner getting out of this? Or, right. you know, going back to Buffy, it's like, how, is they, how are they going to do that? It's like, that lasts. And, you know, not having a movie that was readily available to see, and you had to go to a theater to see it, and you're so into it, I mean, that's really kind of cool. I mean, and it did, it did happen a little bit for me when I was, you know, younger, because I'm 12 now. So that would be, you know, very small amounts of time. But yes, uh -huh. yeah, I was a fetus. And um, I remember my forcing my mom to take me to see Clue, and I was like obsessed. And the the ending that we saw, because it was the, the different endings, mm -hmm. um, 
was uh, the actual ending of the with all of the different endings. It was like the one. It was the third ending that they said this really happened. It was this one. But then seeing it finally, I was like, oh, we have to go again. We have to go again. I was telling all my friends about it, and it was already out the of theaters at that point, and no one would go. And they're like, oh, it's so good. I'm like, no, it was such a good movie. <laughs> and then waiting so long to get the VHS. I remember when it came out, I rented it like five times. And um, my mom would be like, we're not renting that again. <laughs> and you know- And, and that's like, how she sounds. Now it's ridiculous. Like even the Marvel movies come out, they're available for streaming within a month or two. And yeah. on DVD and Blu-ray, like a couple weeks after that, it is just so fast right now. Yep. So you lose a bit of that experience even. You know, most people, like, I know the latest Bond movie, my parents are like, nah, we'll just wait for it to hit streaming in a couple of weeks. Right. What's the and point? Why go to a theater sometimes? So, you know. You no, know, it, it's 100% true. It's almost like, I, I keep saying it, you got to let do the long game for, for some of these movies to catch on. Yeah. You know. But this has been so fun. Thank you, Lisa Kurt Sutton, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So now this has been a Yay. treat. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and for all of you watching, all three of you, my grandma, hi. Uh, next week, Becky and I will be discussing, since the oh. holidays are coming up, we're going to discuss those movies that just make you want to, that make you feel good. That just, you just want to watch with a, you know, when you're having a down day, and they're just gonna the pep you up and make you feel in a better place. So, so we're not my watching choice, Hallmark. <laughs> no, because Hallmark no. is evil. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, but in general, like it's just those movies that just make you. It's, it's your go-to. It's like I'm having a bad day. I'm putting this on, and I'm gonna feel good and laugh. And it's like one of those warm comfort movies. And my choice for this warm comfort film, because I'll go first, because. Poor Becky never gets an opportunity. No, he drops this on me every week. He has something in his head and never <laughs> lets me prepare. So. And I love it. And I'm like, that's not right. That's not the right choice. That's not what I'm saying. Yes, every and week. I laugh and I laugh. <laughs> I do just like that too. <laughs> just remember I'm holding things for Christmas for you. So behave. I know when there's so. stuff I really, really want. And I'm like, hello. Um, but anyway, so this week, uh, for next week, I'm going to choose Legally Blonde because that is my go-to movie when I'm down and I, it just makes me feel, feel good. And I think I quote that movie constantly. All right. So well, that uh, was my choice. Fair. Uh, then I'll make you watch Bridget Jones. <laughs> oh, that's mean. <laughs> so mean. I mean, we've already watched my favorite movie and you know, that's one that I'll just put on randomly. So I get it. No, it's great. I mean, um, the and other that's a far cry. I can make you watch Easy A, which I love. Hey, listen, I, my, I love Easy A. It's great. It is a great movie. It's so weird and goofy, but I like it. So, so which one are you choosing then, Easy A? But see, does that the one you want? <laughs> <laughs> you want Easy A? All right, we'll watch Easy A. I won't make you watch Yay! it until next week. So. So next week we're going to discuss Legally Blonde and Easy A and those warm comfort films. Um, <laughs> and again, thank you again to Lisa Kurt Sutton for joining us and sharing her Rocky Horror history. I think it's great. And we'll, when we actually watch Phantom of the Paradise, which I've never seen, maybe we'll have you come back and talk about that a little bit. I know, it's before Absolutely. my time. And I've never yeah. seen Shock Treatment, so. Well, we'll, we'll do one on Phantom of the Paradise and we'll do one on, on uh, cult sequels, perhaps. There you go. That works. Oh, sequels. I love that. No. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. Be nice to each other and watch some damn movies. Woo. <laughs> All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye. <laughs>